All right, hello and welcome to the Grim Times Podcast, episode number nine. I'm flying solo on this one. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I think the quality should be, be pretty good still. Um, yeah, so what I want to talk about today, I'm going to start off with a couple of things. First off, uh, I've had a very emotionally up and down kind of day. It's been, it's been one of those days. Uh, work was pretty horrible. I mean, it's, it's usually horrible, but it goes back and forth sometimes. And, uh, so yeah, that was a distraction, but I want to start off here by talking about Channing Tatum for a minute. Um, Channing Tatum has been somebody who I've kind of watched rise to fame and all that kind of stuff, and I've always been irritated by this guy. First off, uh, if you know me, Jeff Jarman of The Jeff Jarman Show, you know I'm a big film buff, and, uh, my ultimate goal is to make it as an actor. Well, you have Channing Tatum here. And he's been in all these blockbuster movies lately. Uh, it started out basically with him, uh, when he was younger, he had the choice of either going to college or going to a military private school. And he chose to go to the college. And he was doing that whole deal. And then after that, I guess he started working some odd jobs. Then he uh, was a carpenter or a roofer or something for a little while. And then he decided, I guess, that was too tough for him. So he became a male stripper. Yeah, he was a stripper in real life. And I think that's actually what led to Magic Mike, is he ultimately wanted to make a movie about his experience at doing that, which, you know, great for him and great for all the females, apparently. But he was doing the stripper thing, and then he was discovered by a male model scout or something like that. And he was thrown into these movies, and all of a sudden he's this big star. And uh, let's face it, people, he's not a good actor. A lot of the females will try and say that, oh, he's a wonderful actor, and they think he's good, and blah, blah, blah. But if you know anything about the film industry, you know that he is not a good actor. Take a look at somebody like Leonardo DiCaprio. He's one of those guys who was the teen heartthrob when he was younger, and he could still be now, I don't know. But he is a hell of an actor. I am really impressed. I was impressed with Titanic all the way up until The Great Gatsby. I mean, all this time, he has just been amazing with his roles. But you got Channing Tatum here, who is suddenly this uh, male stripper. He is suddenly the badass who is saving us all from uh, the end of the world, or whatever you want to call it. I, the stupid White House Down movie that just came out. He's the guy saving us all, the male stripper. So I'm just a little irritated by that. And especially when you've got guys like me who we have a passion for the business. We try really hard to get into the business and we're stuck barely getting by in our nine to five job. But you've got guys who are so good looking that they're thrust into, into these roles and they just get everything handed to them on a silver spoon. So. Uh, oh, and on top of that, they've got all of our wives and girlfriends drooling over them. So, uh, yeah, I will never support a Channing Tatum movie. I will never go see it in theaters. Never buy the DVD. Nothing. So, that's my rant for right now. Let's move on to the main topic. I want to talk about religion for a few minutes. Um, well, that's going to be the main part of the show, so I guess it'll be more than a few minutes, but... Um, lately I've been talking to a lot of co-workers and hearing different stories, and I used to study, uh, near-death experiences, um, quite a bit, and she was telling me about a few of them that she had heard, and one in particular was from Africa, and over in Africa, apparently, they don't, um, always embalm their bodies like we do here, and... So it, it helps this story along, just that little piece of information. Um, so there was this guy who had gotten killed. I don't know if it was a car wreck or what happened exactly, but he died. And um, he was dead for two or three days. And his wife refused to let them get rid of the body yet because somehow she knew that he was coming back. I don't know how. But uh, this guy, he saw both heaven and hell, or what he described as those he described heaven as being if you could imagine a like a prairie or a field somewhere and just envision this flower swaying back and forth in the wind 
that's uh, pretty much what he described heaven as. And I've heard many different uh, variations of what heaven would be. And we'll get in, into that in a minute. But he also described hell. And apparently this was not a religious man. He described hell as uh, not a lake of fire. He saw no fire at all. As many cases, I've never heard of anyone describing fire in hell. But this one in particular, he described it as a... Uh, he saw teenagers, a few teenagers, and one of them had, like, blown his head off or something. And what this kid was having to do, to do was vomit and then eat his own vomit. So he was just repeatedly over and over throwing up and then having to eat it again. And, I mean, if you could imagine what hell would be like, what the worst thing that you could think of would be, that would be pretty close. So, I mean, I, I don't know. And this guy, he came back to life, needless to say, like I, like I said, um, two or three days later. And he was fully functional and everything. And science says that after a certain period of time, when you don't have any more air or oxygen going to your brain, your brain is going to start to shut down and die. And as your brain dies, your neurons, they shouldn't be firing off anymore. Because a lot of people, they like to say that uh, with these uh, near-death experiences, the neurons start firing off in your brain, and everybody has this perceived idea of what heaven or hell should be like or what they should see when they die. And therefore, um, their brain pretty much projects it like a dream, and their brain manifests this idea of what it's supposed to be like. But if you think about it, that can't really happen if the person is dead past, I I want to say it's 20 minutes before your brain starts to shut down and die. And uh, if you do come back after those 20 minutes, um, you could be a vegetable, you could lose most of your motor skills. I mean, who knows? Whatever part of your brain starts to die first, that's just how it happens, and you'll come back. But this guy came back fully functional, as a lot of people do, from what I've heard in my near-death experience research. I do a blog as well. It's called Objective Objective Thinking. And uh, I've done, I think I've done a blog or two about that in particular. So uh, it's either at jeffjarman.blogspot.com or blogspot.jeffjarman.com. Anyway, that's where the blog is at. So back to what I was saying. You shouldn't be able to come back after this long with without any um, anything being wrong with your brain or your body. And... So it really boggles the mind. But anyway, like I was saying, once your brain starts to shut down, you shouldn't be able to project those images anymore. Or you can look at, um, you know, like the five-year-old who has a near-death experience. He doesn't know anything about religion, doesn't know anything about heaven or hell, Most in most cases. And, uh, or I mean, there have, I'm sure there have been younger cases. But anyway, he sees this kind of thing. And it's a lot of times very similar to what the adults see. Now, how could this be possible if he has no preconceived notion of what he should see when he dies? I mean, that right there alone should be proof of something. But it will never be proof because it's not written on a piece of paper. And people seem to really need their proof either right in front of their eyes or written on a piece of paper. So, basically where I'm going with this is lately... I've just been frustrated with a lot of things uh, about religion, not not necessarily in the scripture, but in the theology behind it. And uh, I have talked to Skylar about this a little bit, uh, just through text messaging. But um, and we definitely, obviously, did not agree as usual about this subject. But um, my problem is God is almighty or um, omnipotent or I'm trying to think of the right word for it but anyway he knows everything that will happen and has happened and is happening all at the same time that's what we've always been taught and uh, which on a side note it turns out a lot of what we've been taught isn't totally accurate but nonetheless where I'm going with this um, If God knows everything that's going to happen in the future, why would he create a soul 
which he knows will be evil or or be influenced by evil and commit these acts why would he let that soul exist knowing that it's going to do this knowing that it's going to um that's thunder outside i don't know if you can hear it or not why would he create this soul knowing it's going to do this and knowing that by by these rules of the bible that it is going to hell that in essence is pretty much creating a soul just so you can torture it for, for all of eternity why would you create that soul just to torture it forever that itself is basically the cruelest thing i can even imagine or you can look at it like this what about um, the people who are just so scientific that they don't believe what about those people who they're not inherently evil whatsoever they're just too uh, scientifically minded to accept the idea of the man in the sky or whatever as as they like to uh, simplify it as which you know that's not accurate whatsoever either but what I'm saying is those people who can't believe because they're too scientific and I mean that can be stubbornness sure but still they're not evil yet because they don't believe in this God he's going to send them to hell to burn for all of eternity really is that because that's not something I'm willing to accept that is that itself should be considered evil if you're gonna create a soul knowing that it's gonna be like that just to kill it and torture it forever no that is way too messed up for me to accept and I can't therefore I'm starting to look for sources outside of the Christian Bible I mean I've always studied religion in in that sense but I can't deal with that I mean, let's take another example real quick here. Um, say, say that we have a three-year-old, and God knows what the three-year-old is going to do. He knows that, uh, I don't know, maybe it's going to grow up to be a serial killer, and it's going to hurt a lot of people. But children are considered so innocent that they get the free pass to heaven, which would make sense. But if this three-year-old is destined to do this, and the three-year-old dies before he's able to do that. He dies at three years old. Does that baby get a free pass just because he hadn't had time to kill them? Because, I mean, by those rules, that three-year-old should go to hell. That's just how, how their laws lay it out. I don't see why this three-year-old should get a free pass just because he accidentally died early but the person who is allowed to grow and hurt all these people still goes to hell as well because he was given that amount of time to do it. But then again, you could argue that God, it's not possible for this three-year-old to be like that because God already knew that the three-year-old was going to die at the age of three. So then if you're going to create a child just to have it die at the age of three, what is the point of even, even putting that soul through that? Spiritually, like say you are reincarnated again as a human being on earth say that you take the idea of you keep living these lives on earth until the soul matures enough to enter heaven why would you even have that three-year-old come into being because let's face it your soul is not going to learn anything in those three years you're barely conscious in those three years you have like little spots and memories maybe spots spots of memories but Overall, you're not going to get a whole lot out of that. It doesn't make sense to me at all, and it's just been bothering me for so long. These are the questions that I need answers to, and I don't know if anybody can actually give me these answers. They can, you know, spin a web around it, or they can try and talk through it, but overall, I just... I can't accept the notion that hell exists in the sense that they would like it to exist or that Christians want it to exist. It just, the whole logic and the whole idea is flawed. And this is something else. God teaches forgiveness and acceptance and all that kind of stuff. What about uh, Satan? If he truly is evil, why is he not forgiven or taken back? 
Maybe he doesn't want to be taken back. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't. He doesn't want to be forgiven. But see, I think that you've got two different groups of Satanists. You've got the Satanist who is pure evil and believes in this evil entity and does sacrifices and all this messed up stuff. And then you've got the other sect, the other group, that believes that secretly Satan is the good guy and that religion has become so influenced that everything's been spun around with lies and disinformation. I mean, definitely, I would not recommend following Satanism either, either way, but it's just an interesting thought because if you think back to the Old Testament, God was pretty cruel. And I always tell the story about that man. It, it always stuck with me. The man who went out on a Sunday to gather sticks for his family. And speaking of that, I don't even know if it was a Sunday. Because I, I've been told it used to be a Saturday that was the, considered the holy day. So I don't know when it got changed to a Sunday. That was a Catholic church thing, I believe. But anyway, this guy went out to gather sticks on a Sunday. And God had him put to death because he was gathering sticks for his family to keep them warm. And it happened to be on a Sunday. Now, I guess these people were just supposed to stay home and pray to God and he would drop sticks on their front porch or something. I don't know what the rules are with that one. But it just, that's another story that I really have trouble with. First off, it doesn't make sense that he would go out to gather sticks if he knew that God would just drop him, drop him on his doorstep. Maybe this is some church group who came up with this story about, oh, this guy, he uh, is going out to do this, so we have to kill him. And maybe it's a completely human thing. Maybe God had nothing to do with it. But I'm sure if you go back, you can find other stories where God supposedly ordered all these horrible, horrible things to be carried out. So, I mean, I don't know. And if, if God was so present back then, that because everybody talks about faith, you have to have faith and all this stuff. If God was so present back then to where he was being like, hey, just pray for this and I'll drop it out of the sky or I'll manifest it or whatever, why would there be anybody not following him? Why would everybody ignore God or turn away from God if he was like right there in their faces, dropping, showing miracles all the time? It doesn't make sense. Were people just that stupid back then? I don't understand it. Why would they turn away from somebody who's right in front of their face? Why would you, e you wouldn't even need faith. Faith would not be relevant back then. But then all of a sudden, everything stopped happening somewhere along the line. I don't know when it was. I wish I knew. And faith was all there is now. I mean, every now and then you'll have like a little miracle happen in your life. I believe I've had a little miracle or two happen in mine. But other than that, it's pretty much all just based on faith and hearsay by different people and yeah i'm calling part of the bible is just hearsay because nobody let's take the book of matthew there's so many errors in it that it, it's not even funny and they don't even know who wrote the book of matthew yet all of a sudden this is considered the word of god when nobody knows who wrote the book and i'm supposed to just accept that i'm i'm really starting to look at messianic judaism or um, something something along those lines. they I guess they take the first five books of the Bible as the word of God, and then the rest of it is just a commentary or something like that. I don't know. I'm going to have to look into it more, and I'll, I'll talk about that on the next episode. But this is kind of what I want to touch on. And these things, they really make you think, and they make you reevaluate re everything. It says in Revelation... Whoever's name isn't written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. How do you get your name written in that book of life? Shouldn't everyone's name be in the book of life if you're a human, if you're alive, if you have a soul? Maybe the lake of fire is just reserved for Satan and his demons. But then again, if Satan and the demons are just serving this grand purpose, if they're serving this purpose that God made them to serve, why is he condemning them forever? Just like Judas. If Judas hadn't done that to Jesus, then theoretically, Jesus would not have died for our sins and we'd all be screwed. So Judas, really, was a huge tool in this whole deal. Yet, is he burning in hell right now? 
Who knows? All right, well, we're at the end of this podcast. I'm Jeff Jarman. Um, thank you all for listening, if you've stuck with me all the way to the end here. I'm going to do a couple more episodes on this, uh, just kind of venting and sharing my thoughts on the whole matter. So, All right, we'll catch you next time on the Grim Times podcast. Yeah, that was a distraction, but I want to start off here by talking about Channing Tatum for a minute. Um, Channing Tatum has been somebody who I've kind of watched rise to fame and all that kind of stuff, and I've always been irritated by this guy. First off, uh, if you know me, Jeff Jarman of The Jeff Jarman Show, you know I'm a big film buff, and uh, my ultimate goal is to make it as an actor. Well, you have Channing Tatum here, and he's been in all these blockbuster movies lately. Males will try and say that, oh, he's a wonderful actor, and they think he's good, and blah, blah, blah. But if you know anything about the film industry, you know that he is not a good actor. Take a look at somebody like Leonardo DiCaprio. He's one of those guys who was the teen heartthrob when he was younger, and he could still be now, I don't know. But he is a hell of an actor. I am really impressed. I was impressed with Titanic all the way up until The Great Gatsby. I mean, all this time, he has just been amazing with... All right, hello and welcome to the Grim Times Podcast, episode number nine. I'm flying solo on this one. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I think the quality should be, be pretty good still. Um... Yeah, so, what I want to talk about today, I'm going to start off with a couple of things. First off, uh, I've had a very emotionally up and down kind of day. It's been it's been one of those days. Uh, work was pretty horrible. I mean, it's, it's usually horrible, but it goes back and forth sometimes. And uh, so, uh, it started out basically with him, uh... When he was younger, he had the choice of either going to college or going to a military private school, and he chose to go to the college, and he was doing that whole deal, and then after that, I guess he started working some odd jobs. Then he uh, was a carpenter or a roofer or something for a little while, and then he decided, I guess, that was too tough for him, so he became a male stripper. Yeah, he was a stripper in real life, and... I think that's actually what led to Magic Mike, is he ultimately wanted to make a movie about his experience at doing that, which, you know, great for him, and great for all the females, apparently. But he was doing the stripper thing, and then he was discovered by a male model scout or something like that, and he was thrown into these movies, and all of a sudden he's this big star, and uh, let's face it, people, he's not a good actor. A lot of the female